Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to our CPD for tonight. Um, before I introduce our, uh, our guest lecture, uh, just a couple of things. Um, we've got a problem in our eyes, as you can see, the camera seems to have been swayed, but I'm told there are some people there, so as long as they can hear and see us, that's okay. The other problem is about um, Townsville. Um, Townsville's lost a camera, but um, once again, I'm told they can see and hear us, so that's good. Can I, can I just say to the people in Townsville that um, I've been asked by Stephanie to ask you to sign the paper um, to get your CPD certificate. Um, tonight's lecture, I'm told, may go a little bit longer than usual. Um, David's got a lot of stuff for us and uh, I'm sure it's going to be well worth um, listening to. I had the pleasure yesterday of uh, hearing David speak at the students' conference. Um, he was good enough to give up his time for the students and presented a, a very entertaining lecture, pretty much telling the students what, was it, what they could expect over the next 40 years of their careers. Um, it was quite interesting and a bit daunting from, from my um, perspective because uh, I could see what end of the spectrum I was at and it wasn't very pleasant. But um, I've had a bit to do with David. Um, and when I was in private practice, I, um, I used his laboratory for my work and I was very pleased with the quality and here at James Cook University, we're also using Southern Cross Dental Labs. David, most of you would know that he's the CEO of Southern Cross Dental Laboratories. Um, he's been involved with a lot of research with dental materials, uh, written an excellent text on dental laboratory um, and clinical techniques. And it's my pleasure tonight to uh, invite him to speak to you. Please welcome David. Um, welcome everybody. Um, you please feel free to come a little bit close if you can. I, think, I haven't got any sort of communicable diseases. At least I don't think so anyway. Um, the food at the hills and so far has been pretty good. Um, tonight's going to be uh, quite a serious sort of lecture. I gave a lecture to the students yesterday which was a lot of fun. Um, just telling them about all the milestones from uh, after you practice, or after you graduate, and uh, what's, what's likely to happen. We had a few laughs which was great. Um, I think some of them might well reconsider actually becoming dentists now after some of the things I told them. But uh, it was a lot of fun. But tonight we're going to concentrate on an area which is uh, near and dear to me. Uh, I'm working, I work as a, as a dentist uh, in my own practice in Sydney. Um, it's a shocking photo, but anyway. Um, there's a little bit about my history. So it's, you know, the, I've done a, I guess the, the, the intriguing part about what I've done, and I guess what I'm very lucky of is I've had a rather diverse career, and uh, I've been extremely fortunate uh, in that sort of I've made a few decisions in my life which have taken me in the right direction. Um, and um, I, I got involved in particular in about 2006. Align Technology asked me to get involved with uh, with Invisalign and what I could do with Invisalign as far as general practice is concerned. And that sort of uh, made me sort of change direction quite significantly and adopt something which I call is a green philosophy. And that's basically which sort of suggests we try and move the teeth into the most idyllic position before we start to restore them. And it's something I'm quite passionate about and you may see some articles in various journals and magazines about it. Um, I'm doing a lot of research, which is fun. Uh, at the stage of my career, I must admit that I can pick and choose what I want to do. Um, I'm working with, with a couple of different universities on different uh, devices at the moment. One thing that I can say to you before we go into the sort of talking about dental materials is that I'm seeing that as dentists we're going to be treating a lot of uh, systemic disorders through um, intraoral appliances in the next 10 years. Um, first of all I saw uh, the anti-snoring devices and then that led into sleep apnea devices. And that's a, quite an intriguing field through mandibular advancement splints. But then I got involved um, with the tension headache devices, and which also lead to bruxism uh, devices. So which you're going to sort of see something, uh, so a few devices released into the market in the next six, six months and 12 months, which are going to take us as practicing dentists down a different route. So whilst it's very important that I want you to go through all the tooth colored materials in the crown and bridge, I just want you to keep your eyes open to some fascinating new um, new products that are around the corner which will um, have a big impact on the way that we practice dentistry. 
Um, all right, so look, what I'm going to start off with, the first thing I want to tell you is be careful. Um, you might wonder why I've got a big caution sun up here. One of the big problems I see uh, uh, working with Southern Cross is we're dealing with thousands of dentists, not just in Australia, but in lots of countries now. And one of the big problems I sort of see is a lack of understanding and knowledge about dental materials, in particular, in particular tooth coloured materials. Uh, the reason I can tell, first of all, not only from a preparatory point of view, but also when we get order forms, prescriptions, that a lot of dentists write down uh, materials that are absolutely incorrect for that procedure or for, for, that, for that treatment plan. And this is very, very frustrating. I'll see knife edge preparations on lithium disilicate. I'll see all sorts of things, lack of occlusal reduction. I'll see uh, PFM or uh, all ceramic crowns on upper laterals where no reduction has been done on the palatal side whatsoever. Uh, and when we ring up and we ask somebody, will please explain why you've done this and why you've chosen that material, there just seems to be a complete lack of understanding. So hopefully by the end of tonight, I would have uh, pinpointed some of the differences in the materials. But I encourage you as much as you possibly can, examine all this stuff, uh, examine a lot of the, the literature that's coming out of some of the bigger, uh, more uh, renowned manufacturers, and, and probably believe about half of it. Unfortunately, you'll find there's a, there's a major problem at the moment between 3M and Ivoclar, and there is a lot of, uh, I can, let's just sort of say lithium disilicate of Emacs has taken over a lot of the old ceramic part of the market. And given that 3M in a position where 3M are trying to grab back market share. Now, what concerns me when there's a commercial implication as, um, as onerous as that is that a lot of the research then is done in the marketing department. And a lot of claims are made, and somewhere I'll be running through some of these things tonight to basically say to you, be careful and don't believe everything that you read. I'm going to show you some world first stuff tonight, which I've been really reluctant to sort of, I'm um, doing some research a couple of months ago. And I've found some things here which are a little disturbing, but I'm going to share them with you tonight, and you can make your own judgments on that. The first thing I'm going to sort of say is that I want you to think first and foremost about all ceramics or all tooth coloured crowns, is there got to be a default position in terms of the preparations that you do. And I want you to be introspective and totally candid with yourselves. And when you do prepare, pre pre preparing anterior crowns in particular, I want you to really focus and think, am I actually producing a preparation which is going to do justice to the material? So the rules for good preparation design are something we cannot circumvent. And Bob, I'm sure you're teaching, at least I'm, I'm certain that you'll be teaching all these rules. And I think the problem is that we see that when a lot of dentists get into private practice, some of these tend to go out the window. I wouldn't say near enough is good enough, but at times we sort of see things which we just really, um, as practicing dentists ourselves who run Southern Cross, I wouldn't say we're ashamed of, but we're certainly concerned about. We have a number of our dentists, we call them DBP dentists. And DBP is an acronym for Do Best Possible. So can anybody tell me what proportion, for instance, of impressions received in commercial laboratories in Australia do you think do not record all the margins? Anybody like to hazard a guess? I do not record. There's been two major studies done. It's quite interesting. Anybody got any idea? So do not. Not, not do, but do not. Anybody like to hazard a guess? 50. 75. Can we, can we have more? It's like an auction. Um, you're talking about 85%. So if you sat with me each day in the laboratory, when our work comes in, and we might see 500 cases come in, we will see in the Crown and Bridge cases, we'll see about 85% of them with a critical eye that you can't see all the margins. Now we're not talking about axial wall reduction, we're not talking about occlusal reduction, we're not talking about rounding internal line angles, we're not talking about any of that stuff yet. 
We're just talking about margins. All right? Now, you can imagine from our perspective, we've got dentists who work in our lab who've got master's degrees in prosthodontics. And they're looking at these things and they have to make these phone calls every single day to dentists around the country saying, did you have a Labrador sitting next to your chair today? Now, that might sort of sound funny, but what's actually happening is you think, do you actually look at this thing? And for us then, it's really perplexing because we're running a commercial laboratory, but on the other hand, we're dentists and we do have an ethical and moral responsibility. So what do we do? We have to make these phone calls and say, well, what do you think about this? Now, unfortunately, we do get a proportion of the dentists who say DBP. So what does that mean? What do you think that the definition of a DBP dentist actually is? Does it mean I don't really care? Now, interestingly enough, the number of redos we get, guess which proportion of our dentists have the lowest number of redos? The DBPs. So we must be unbelievably good at guessing where those margins are. Because it's quite, it's quite amazing very few of those come back. All I'm sort of saying is that we do have to make compromises. We do the best we can. And I think our re redo rate is one of the lowest in the world. So I think we must be doing something which is fairly good. But nevertheless, that's only the start of the problems. Coming back to this default position, we talk about the rules for good preparation. We haven't even started talking about is there enough axial wall reduction. Now, in particular, young females, when they first graduate, we notice they tend to be too conservative. They don't cut the tooth structure down. I'm not casting any aspersions at any people in this room tonight, but all I'm sort of saying is young females tend to be very conservative. Now, is that a function of the university? Is it a function of their inexperience? But then again, we get older dentists who, let's just sort of say, are rushed for time, and they tend to over-prepare. So what I'm sort of suggesting here is I just want you to be cognizant of the fact that there are rules and these rules are very, very important. They become more important when you start getting into the all ceramic area. So PFM, you can get away with murder. But getting into the all ceramic realm, you have to concentrate, you have to look a lot more carefully and you have to really look at a number of issues which you're going to talk about. First of all, uniform reduction. That's really important. How many times do we see a tooth which is reduced, huge amount of labial reduction, but a minimum amount of, of, lay, of, of our palatal reduction? Or what about insufficient occlusal reduction on posteriors? Bob was sort of saying before, sometimes the crowns come back and they're a little bit amorphous. Well, we articulate, and how much room have we got? Not much. So by the time we put a metal coping on and allowing for some uh, cement, some room for some cement, and then we're going to put ceramic over the top, we're really stretching. So I want you to stop and think about a little bit about this. I'm going to show you some diagrams in a moment, which I'd like you to try and stick to if you can. As far as ceramics are concerned, the big drama is if you have a thick piece of ceramic, then a thin piece, then a thick piece again, what's going to happen? Where's it going to be the weakest? Where the thin bit is. It flexes a little bit and you're in big trouble. So uniform reduction is really, really important. Um, the other thing is sharp edges. And I mean, you've all heard the story before about a stone hitting the front of your windscreen and then the crack propagating. We're going to talk about zirconia and why crack propagation doesn't occur with zirconia. Cracks still run through it, but there's actually yttrium inside which stops the cracks from actually running all the way through. But there's cracks all over. So when we look at this diagram, this is one um, that it's a you know, week you can... Um, we can get this to you if you... But, I mean, most of you should know this. The question is, do most of us actually practice this? And what I'm sort of saying, if you look at the top left-hand corner with the, uh, the, the uh, anterior tooth, how wide should the shoulder be? How much axial wall reduction should you do? How much occlusal or incisal reduction should you do? And in particular, I mean, those football bows, you obviously see those little crown and bridge kits. They're designed specifically so that you can actually reduce the tooth in those particular areas uniformly. But these rules are important. Now, when you've got a metal coping underneath and you're making a PFM or a VMK, you can get away with murder. The great thing about the, the, the brilliant strength of, of the metal copings is they don't flex very much at all. 
Now, if you get a VMK or a PFM and the ceramic comes off, why do you think most of the time you get a D-bond between the metal and the ceramic? Anybody like to hazard a guess? Anybody? Ah, there's a man. He's, he knows what he's talking about. Exactly. When, why does the metal flex? Why doesn't the metal flex? Why does the metal flex sometimes? Because of diameter. So the moment we actually have less reduction, the metal gets very, very thin, and all of a sudden it starts to bend a little bit. When it bends, what happens to the joint between the ceramic and the metal? Bingo. Off she comes. Ever happened to anybody? They come back, put a crown in. What about when you cement a crown, say to the patient, I've seen some dentists that say, bite together. You want a passive fit where you possibly can. So the moment you get an active fit and you get that metal pushing up against the, the tooth surface, what's going to happen? The metal starts to flex a bit. When the metal flex, what, what actually happens? The chances are that that ceramic can come off. So these rules, the rules that we've got here, um, again, they apply to PFM, but as I said, you can get away with murder. Occlusal reduction, 1.5 to 2 millimetres. That's even more important when it comes to all ceramic restorations. Uh, I see so many people sort of who just do not do enough occlusal reduction. And I'll show you photos of broken crowns in a moment. And most of the time, what do you think the reason is? In, insufficient occlusal reduction, one, and sharp line angles. So when we come over here to the right hand side, so we're talking about margins now. We're talking about chamfers, we're talking about shoulders. Just tell me out of interest, uh, how many of you actually prepare anterior crowns with shoulders? Nobody? One. One shoulder. Two. Three others. There's a few hands coming up. Okay, what do the rest of you do? Chamfer? So could you please tell me what the difference between a chamfer and a shoulder is? So really what we're trying to do is say a shoulder is like that. Everybody agree where it's with a sharp angle and a chamfer has got something which is nice and right. It's interesting, when you start to look under a microscope though, under a huge magnification, there's almost no such thing as a pure shoulder. Because when you blow it up and blow it up, it looks even, it's interesting that it actually they all tend to look a little bit like that. Um, regardless of what you do, the schools in the States is about a 50-50 difference between them. Some are teaching um, shoulders, some are teaching chamfers, some teach both. I haven't got a problem really, whatever it is. But what we're really after is a clearly defined margin. Now, if you can look at on the bottom left-hand side where it says no, the one of particular interest where we see a lot of dramas are the J-shaped margins. Now, interestingly enough, when you try and scan an area like that, it won't pick up the J. The J is obviously the, is a, is a, the shape of, of a J down there, and it's that little spicule on the bottom that causes all the problem. Now, how many of you have done this? And I've done this a few times. When I was younger, oh my God, I heard that terrible noise. You know the one I'm talking about? Uh, bite together, please. You cement it in, you push it down, and you hear the little crunching noise. Now, what's the crunching noise? Is that little spicule there has actually grabbed a little bit of porcelain, broken a little bit of porcelain off. Now, why does it actually happen? Where do you think J-shaped J margins have come from? When you look at the birds, it always intrigues me when I go into a practice um, or some of the dental schools and they say, show me what birds you're using to produce your shoulders or your chamfers. Now, if you're going to try and produce something that's like that, how can you get a shoulder like that when you're using something that's a bullet, that's the shape of a bullet? So I watch the dentist prepare the margin, they go straight down. And what really scares the dental to me, they go straight to the margin first. I sort of say, please, try and finish it super gingerly if you possibly can. Even if you do make the J shape then, but at least if you do make the J shape, what do you do then? What type of bird would you use then to get rid of that J shape? Something with a right angle on the bottom of it, at least something with a right angle, or an end cutting bird. Now, do any of you use end cutting birds? Okay, great. End cutting birds, I think, superb. Lots of different types. You've got ones that we've got tissue protection. Now, you've got ones with different, different types of diamonds on the end. Some have got big aggressive diamonds, some of them have got things. I usually find end cutting birds that are older or even better because you can give them a bit of a push 
without fear of gouging the margins. So what I sort of suggest, even if you do produce a J-shaped margin, that's okay, but then make sure you've got something where you can flatten that off because that little spicule is very dangerous and particularly dangerous with all ceramic crowns. So that's something I want to want you to watch for. Now, as far as recording those margins are concerned, if you don't reflect the tissue there, you might even see the fact that you've got a J-shaped margin. That little spicule be sitting right next to the gingiva, and unless you've really reflected the tissue properly, you won't see it. The only time you'll see it is when you go and cement the crown, and you'll hear that wonderful little noise. It's happened to, I'm, I'm sure all of you have happened to, I don't know if anyone would admit it, but it certainly happened to me a few times. But all I'm sort of saying is reflect and grind that off as if you possibly can. The other things here are pre all pretty obvious to you. Um, the thing is, I guess the only other one that I'd really like to draw attention to is that sharp edge, the sharp edge on the incisor. I still see this time and time and time again. Please, if you can, just get out a soft flex disc, get out a silicon wheel, whatever you